Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's student CPC. Today, the first case is from the Department of Pediatric Critical Care. Uh, it's of a three-month-old uh, male child. And I invite uh, Dr. Anadeep for the clinical presentation. Good morning, everyone. I would be presenting the first case of the student CPC today from the Pediatric Emergency and Critical Care Unit. Our case for today is baby A, a three-month-old boy child, residence of Panch resident of Panchkula, Haryana, born on 30th of July, 22, admitted to PJ on the 23rd of October 22, and date of demise being 25th of October, with the total duration of hospital stay being 25 hours. The child was born as a, a term 40 weaker, with 3.12 kg being birth weight, appropriate for gestational age, cried immediately after birth with a smooth perinatal transition. At six weeks of age, child had first admission to PGI with the symptoms of acute onset respiratory distress and one episode of cyanosis with unresponsiveness. He was asymptomatic till three months of age, when child had second admission with complaints of cough and noisy breathing for five days with three episodes of cyanosis with unresponsiveness. And sadly, child died on the second admission. First admission from 16th to 19th of September, child had a history of immunization with Pantavac, OPV and IPV at six weeks. And next day, child presented with a sudden onset, increased work of breathing, one episode of bluish discoloration and unresponsiveness for 10 minutes. On examination, child had subcoastal intercoastal retractions and left-sided crepitations in upper and lower zones. Rest of the examination was normal. The X-ray will be discussed by my radiology colleague. On CSF examination, it revealed 23 cells with elevated protein of 114. The child was initially thought to be a brief resolved unresponsive event, secondary to an adverse event following immunization. However, X-ray and CSF analysis indicated an aspiration pneumonia or meningitis, and child was treated with nasal prong oxygen, was started on IV cefataxime, and was back referred for completion of 14 days antibiotic course once he was fit for discharge. In the second admission, child presented with cough for five days, which was non-productive, with no positional or diurnal variation, and not associated with any post of vomiting. He had noisy breathing, which was gradual onset, present both during inspiration and expiration, with no positional or diurnal variation. And then the day previous to admission, child had three episodes of increased noisy breathing, followed by bluish discoloration of palms, soles, and lips. However, there was no history of fast breathing or indrawing of chest wall, no history of any foreign body ingestion, choking episodes while feeding, or abnormal body movements. When he presented to the triage, child's airway was open and stable, respiratory rates were 40 per minute with increased efforts, and strider was present, with a saturation of 91% on room air, which increased to 99% on 40% FiO2. Circulatory-wise, visibility and exposure were all normal findings. The child was physiologically categorized as respiratory failure with level one resuscitation. On examination, child was seen to be underweight with a Z-score of minus 2.7. There were no dysmorphic features, pallor, ectrus, or cyanosis. On chest examination, an audible inspiratory and expiratory strider were present, and rest of the systemic examination was normal. Now, uh, radiology will be discussed by my radiology colleague. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to present the radiological part of this case. Uh, the child has undergone uh, two X-ray investigations in our institute. On the first, in the first, in the first X-ray, we can appreciate that only the uh, the upper part of the trachea is only visible, and the remaining, the distal portion of the trachea and the major bronchi, right and the left major bronchi, are, are not visible. And the apex of the heart is seen uh, pointing towards the right. So, and the left and the right border of the heart is seen towards the left side, suggesting of dextrocardia. And the cardiac uh, liver shadow and the fundus, gastric fundus shadow is seen on the their respective sides, suggestive of situs solitus. And the coming to the lung fields, there are uh, lung fields on the right side are clear, whereas in the left lung fields, there are fluffy radio opaque densities are seen in the involving the entire left lung. And the bilateral, uh, the right costophrenic apical angle, angle appear clear and the left also appear clear. And no free air or sick can be seen under the both domes of the diaphragm. However, the bubble loops appear air filled, which appear normal. So coming to the uh, provisional diagnosis on the base of the chest X-ray, uh, X-ray uh, chest and abdominal X-ray provided. So there is the possible positive findings of non-visualization of distal part of the trachea and the right and left side of the main focus and dextrocardia uh, and fluffy radio opaque densities on the left side of the lung consist of any infective etiology. So this is the 
second x-ray which the child has undergone uh, in the later court of his admission so the findings of the prior x-ray are almost similar to in the second x-ray see here we can see only the partial uh, upper uh, portion of the trachea is visible uh, which is showing gradual tapering beyond which the trachea air shadow tracheal air shadow is not visible whereas the right and left major bronchi are also not visible similarly that extracardia uh, which i explained on the previous x-ray is, is visible on this also and the radio opaque uh, density is seen on the left side of the x-ray were uh, mostly resolved but still there are uh, certain uh, small radio opaque densities are can be seen on the left side left side of the lung uh, in the uh, there are no free air of uh, free air can be seen under the both rooms of the diaphragm whereas the bowel loops are mildly distended with showing uh, fluid le uh, air levels so the same uh, diagnosis can be made it here also the non visualization of the upper part of the trachea and the major uh, right and left major bronchus with dextrocardia and cytosolic exposition so coming uh, summarizing uh, the findings of on both x ray so the child men can have the uh, partial agencies or partial stenosis of the laryngeal uh, or tracheal upper trachea so however the x ray is not the definitive modality to confirm the diagnosis of this uh, tracheal stenosis or atresia Thank you, sir. Coming to the management in ER, initially the child was uh, treated as a case of acute laryngotracheal bronchitis, was kept on nasal prong oxygen, adrenaline nebulization, and dexamethasone. However, at around 12 to 18 hours of stay, uh, in view of non response and persistent strider, alternative causes of airway obstruction were considered, and an ENT opinion was sought for upper airway evaluation. The, uh, on direct laryngoscopy, epiglottis could be visualized, and supraglottic area was reported to be normal and an X-ray soft tissue neck and a fiber optic bronchoscopy were advised. However, at 24 hours of stay in the hospital, there was a critical event where there was a sudden episode of apnea, cyanosis, and bradycardia. Uh, there was a difficult airway where intubation with 3.5 mm ET tube failed. A 3 mm ET tube could be inserted. However, it could not be negotiated beyond one centimeters of the vocal cord. Uh, in view of difficult airway, activation of ENT and pediatric anesthesia team was done. The child required two cycles of CPR, however, child could be revived. One hour later, there was an accidental extubation, and there was a situation of can't intubate and can't oxygenate, and child was immediately shifted to 8 OT for securing a definitive airway. Emergency tracheostomy was being done, a surgical incision was given, however, tracheostomy tube could not be inserted. Instead, a 2.5 mm ET tube was inserted, however, ventilation could not be achieved, and the child uh, died. So the unit diagnosis was an extrathoracic large airway obstruction, probably a congenital airway malformation, likely congenital tracheal stenosis, and the cause of death was hypoxemia. So for coming to our discussion, for the database, we have a three-month-old boy child who had a brief resolved unresponsive episode at six weeks of age treated as meningitis, now presenting with an acute onset strider with intermittent cyanosis and unresponsive episodes, on examination had a biphasic strider in hypoxemic respiratory failure, and chest X-ray suggests of narrowing of larynx or non-visualization of trachea with dextrocardia. There was a situation of difficult to intubate, difficult to ventilate. There was a failed tracheostomy, and finally, child succumbed to hypoxemia. Now, the questions to be answered are, where is the pathology? What is the anatomical localization? What is the level and the type of obstruction? What could be the likely etiology? Where, why there was an asymptomatic interval between the two episodes? Are there any other organs that were involved? And what were the terminal events that led to the demise of the child? So coming to the anatomical localization, as a child presented with strider, an acute episodic cyanosis with breathing difficulty and unresponsiveness, and it was a neurologically normal child, uh, it can be localized to the airway, the pathology. Coming to level of obstruction, uh, the airway can be broadly divided into an extrathoracic airway and an intrathoracic airway. Extrathoracic airway can be further divided into supraglottic, glottic and subglottis, and the cervical trachea. And uh, based on the level of obstruction, the uh, different type of strider are produced. In general, a supralaryngeal obstruction produces an inspiratory strider. A glottic and subglottic obstruction would produce a biphasic strider. And an intrathoracic obstruction would produce an expiratory strider. As our index case has an inspiratory plus expiratory strider, it can be seen that obstruction can be at the level of glottis and subglottis and the cervical trachea. Coming to the type of obstruction, obstruction can be dynamic, where the airway function changes with posture, sleep or wake state, and the phase of respiration. Or it can be a fixed obstruction, where the anatomical obstruction can be due to an intraluminal or an extrinsic compression. 
as our index case had a persistent strider with no change with posture or phase of respiration, and there was difficulty in passing an endotracheal tube as well as a tracheostomy tube, uh, uh, most likely our index case has a fixed type of airway obstruction. Coming to the etiology of airway obstruction in a young infant, they can be further classified into supraglottic, glottic, and infraglottic. In supraglottic, uh, causes can be coronal atresia, encephalocele, etc. Glottic include croup, laryngomalacia, vocal cord paralysis, subglottic stenosis, and tracheal include tracheomalacia, congenital tracheal stenosis, and any extensive compression by a vascular ring. As already discussed, supraglottic uh, causes seem to be down in the order in our index case. It, uh, it is less likely to be croup as it showed no response to nebulization with adrenaline and we could not pass an ET tube or tracheostomy tube. And dynamic causes of obstruction like laryngomalacia, vocal cord paralysis, and tracheomalacia are also less likely. Congenital airway anomalies by themselves are a very rare entity with incidence of 0.2 to 1 in 10,000 live births and glottic and subglotting being more common than the tracheal anomalies. Common causes in the order of their incidence have been listed. Laryngomalacia, bilateral vocal cord paralysis, subglottic stenosis, laryngeal web, subglottic hemangioma, etc. So coming to our case, there was a young infant with a large airway obstruction. We consider the obstruction to be below the level of glottis. It was a fixed anatomical obstruction with X-ray suggestive of laryngeal or tracheal narrowing, and there was a difficulty in securing a definitive airway. Considering all these points, I would put my diagnosis as a congenital airway malformation, might be a congenital laryngotracheal stenosis, subglottic stenosis, a laryngotracheoesophageal cleft, or a laryngeal web. Coming to laryngotracheal stenosis, the points for laryngotracheal stenosis have been listed. The age of presentation, biphasic strider, recurrent uh, synotic episodes, X-ray showing a less prominent tracheal shadow, and difficulty in securing an airway. However, the acute onset presentation might be against it. However, that will be explained in the next slide. Three types of laryngotracheal stenosis have been explained. Uh, general hypoplasia, funneling, and a segmental stenosis. Child is likely to have a generalized hypoplasia as there was difficulty in passing airway at two levels. Congenital subglottic stenosis also because of age of presentation, biphasic strider, respiratory failure, and difficulty in passing an ET tube beyond vocal cord. However, there shouldn't have been difficulty in passing a tracheostomy tube. Laryngotracheoesophageal cleft also would produce a strider, coughing, cyanosis. There, there would be difficulty in achieving ventilation via tracheotomy because the tube will slip into the esophagus over the superior edge of the defect. However, direct laryngoscopy did not reveal any kind of cleft, and ET tubes should have passed easily into the larynx during intubation. Extrinsic causes like vascular ring, bronchial cyst, or bronchogenic cyst would also produce strider respiratory failure, and as dextrocardia was there, there might be an associated cardiac malformation as well. However, X-ray was not suggestive of any tracheal compression or deviation or difficulty in passing tube at two levels are points against an extrinsic compression. The last question to be answered is why the child was asymptomatic at birth and also between two episodes. Congenital airway malformations are generally asymptomatic at birth. However, fixed anatomical narrowing of airways can present even in early infancy. As the infant grows, the activity increases, his respiratory requirement increases, and stenotic lesions can be precipitated. And any intercurrent viral illness can cause edema and further aggravate the existing airway obstruction, leading to respiratory failure. It has been seen that congenital tracheal stenosis can also be associated with other anomalies like left lip and palate, cardiac anomalies, renal anomalies, and syndromic association. Coming to the pre-terminal events, uh, my case would likely have a congenital airway malformation, likely to be a laryngotracheal stenosis, which was precipitated by the viral illness, leading to an acute life-threatening airway obstruction, leading to a state of can't intubate and can't oxygenate, and finally we were unable to secure a definitive airway, and child had hypoxemia, which led to the demise of the child. So my final diagnosis would be a large central airway obstruction, likely to be a congenital airway malformation, possibly congenital laryngotracheal stenosis, there was dextrocardia, child was underweight, and the cause of death was central airway obstruction with hypoxemia with the expected autopsy findings as follows. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll be presenting the pathology counterpart of this case. So, the child is a three-month-year-old male presenting with congenital tracheal stenosis and with a query of intrathoracic luminal airway obstruction. The prosectors had noted that there was an umbilical hernia measuring 1 into 0.5 centimeter comprising of bowel loops, and there was a suture wound present at the level of the sternal rod, probably the tracheostomy site. The serous cavities were within normal limits. This is a gross photograph of the trachea. We can say that uh, without on the outer surface there is no fistula or connection to the esophagus and there is no outpouching noted in the trachea per se and in the superior part it is adherent to the uh, thyroid gland. On the cut surface the trachea, of the trachea there is no ulceration or exudates and during autopsy they did not notice any foreign bodies. 
and there was no stenotic bands or luminal narrowing or webs seen in the cut section of the trachea. So the superior run down view of the trachea showing the vocal cords and this is a tracheostomy size. We had taken cut section of the entire trachea and it did not show luminal narrowing or webs at any level of the trachea. This is a schematic representation to show the uh, relationship between the trachea, the pretracheal sheath and the thyroid gland. We had processed the trachea in total and here we can see the trachea with the surrounding pretracheal fascia and the thyroid cartilage. This is a mesens trichome stain of the same section which highlights the pretracheal fascia. A hyper image showing the pretracheal fascia with slips of fibrosis extending into the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland shows atrophic follicles and variably dilated follicles. This is a mesens trichome stain highlighting the pretracheal fascia and the slips of fibrotic bands. There are these are uh, the atrophic follicles and the dilated follicles admixed with each other. Uh, again showing the lining epithelium, showing that there is no increase in fibrosis and the uh, trachea. We had processed the trachea in total and these are multiple sections of the trachea to highlight that there are no luminal webs, stenotic bands or outpouchings. So summary of the findings in the trachea, the vocal cord was patent, there were no webs, fibrosis or luminal narrowing, no hematomas, there was thyroid follicular atrophy with fibrosis. Next, going on to the thymus, the thymus weighed 27 grams, which was increased for the age. And on the low power microphotograph, we can see there is maintained architecture. The high power photograph showing there is mild cortical hypoplasia and there were stress inflammatory changes in the form of these hazardous corpuscles. Next, the lung weighed 65 grams. The outer surface shows diffuse subpleural hemorrhages and the cut surface shows diffuse consolidation with partly preserved lung species. This is a section from the hyla region to highlight the bronchus. There is no bronchopneumonia or uh, uh, secretions inside the bronchus. The bronchus is patent and the arteries do not show any thrombus. A hyper image from the area showing that there is diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and mild inflammatory infiltrates present in this area. Hyper microphotograph of the same area depicting the same. From the adjacent area, we had taken sections and we have this pale, uh, pale blink edematous fluid in the lung highlighting the pulmonary edema. These are the adjacent areas showing the normal areas. So in the lung, we have pulmonary hemorrhage and pulmonary edema. The heart weighed 39 grams and it was globular in shape. We had dissected the great arteries and the great arteries, there was a connection between, connection between this iota and the pulmonary artery through which the probe is passed. This tells us there is a patent ductus arteriosus. We had dissected the inflow and outflow tracts. The left inflow and outflow tract was unremarkable and as well as the right. In right inflow, there was a uh, right outflow, there was ventricular hypoplasia. So there was aortic, uh, aortic sac dilatation with a prominent bridge, a prominent ridge, aortic ridge. Possibly, possibly there could have been a subaortic stenosis. <laughs> So the uh, foramen oval was patent and there was no patent foramen oval and there was no ventricular septal defect. The micro microscopically the uh, heart was largely unremarkable. So in the heart there was patent of the arteriosus and right ventricular hypertrophy. So this is the gross photograph of the anterior and posterior surface of the esophagus and stomach. So in the posterior surface of the esophagus we can see there is no additions of fistula note. Microphotograph of the esophagus, which is unremarkable. Uh, this is the small and the large intestine. We had seen it was grossly and microscopically unremarkable. Incidentally, there was a Meckel's diverticulum, which was 1.3 cm identified in the small intestine. The next organ complex comprises of the liver, the pancreas, and the spleen. The liver weighed 150 grams and the spleen weighed 20 grams. The low part microphotograph of the liver shows maintained lobular architecture. This microphotograph shows a normal architecture, a normal relationship between the central vein and the portal tract. And there was no uh, portopotal or portocentral fibrosis, which is supported by the mason trichome and the reticulum stem. A high power image show, uh, of the liver showing microvascular steatosis, dilated sinusoids, uh, dilated uh, sinusoids, which could probably due to the terminal events. Low power image of the spleen showing the uh, red pulp and the white pulp and high power image highlighting the white pulp, there is no lymphoid depletion. 
A microphotograph of the pancreas showing the uh, normal lobular architecture with the eyelids and the ducts. There was no increase in fibrosis, nor there was any inspissated secretions in the ducts. The next organ complex comprises of the bilateral kidneys, but ureters and the urinary bladder. The cut surface of the kidney was unremarkable. There was distinct corticomedullary junction. There was no focal lesion identified. Microphotograph of the kidney showing the uh, tubules and the glomeruli. The tubules did not show any evidence of tubulitis or cast nephropathy. Hyper image depicting the uh, glomeruli, which was largely unremarkable. The brain weighed 675 grams, gross weight was unremarkable, and microscopically there was mild meningeal edema and congested vessels. However, there was no e any exudates identified in the meningeal. <laughs> We have taken sections from the adrenal gland, skin, lymph node, and testis. All were unremarkable, did not show any significant findings. So, I would like to arrive at a final autopsy diagnosis of in this three month year old male as thymic hypoplasia with diffuse pulmonary hemorrhage with pulmonary edema, patent ductus arteriosus with right ventricular hypertrophy, and Meckel's diverticula. So, uh, there have been, we had looked for many syndromic associations between these entities, however, we could not end in any. But there were a lot of papers highlighting that the thymic hypoplasia could result in this respiratory distress. And there were uh, articles suggesting a true thymic hypoplasia would be characterized with massic thymic hypertrophy, as in our case. However, uh, it could not, it, it, uh, the known cause to medicinal compression could be acute or recurrent in this pediatric age groups. Thank you.